Good morning. My name is Mashuru Vasuta Rambutle. I would like to welcome you all to the fourth of six online policy dialogues as part of the Southern Africa Towards In Inclusive Economic Development SA Tide Program Research into Policy Series. SA Tide is a collaborative research policymaking and capacity building partnership between the National Treasury, UNU Wider, the South African Revenue Service, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, the International Food Policy Research Institute and the European Union. The program also includes a number of local and international universities. The work of SA Tide has been generously supported by funding from the EU. We are forever grateful for this support. So since its inception in 2017, the program's goal is improved economic research for informed evidence-based policy to promote inclusive growth in South Africa and the region. It is a result of a unique collaboration between local and international officials and experts under six work streams, namely enterprise development, public revenue, macro modeling, inequality, climate and energy and regional growth. You're all able to access all this valuable research done over the past three years on the SA Tide website. Today's policy dialogue is hosted under the work stream, Turning the Tide on Inequality. We will seek with our panelists to unpack the difficult subject of funding social policy priorities amid economic inequality in South Africa. We will begin with a synthesis of research findings produced under the inequality work stream by Murray Lembrock. He's the professor of economics at the University of Cape Town and a non-resident res um, senior research fellow at UNU Wider. To you, our audience men members, a very warm welcome to this policy dialogue this morning. We encourage you to be part of the conversation by writing your questions on the chat box or raising your hand and we will give you the speech speaking rights so that you can pose your questions uh, to our panelists. They will be more than happy to respond to any questions that you might have for them this morning. So to kick things off, we've got that synthesis presentation uh, from Murray. You can take it away, Murray. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gracie, you're going to put up the slides. So uh, let me let me welcome you on behalf of our, our uh, Workstream 4 team. Um, uh, next slide, please, Gracie. So turning the tide on inequality, it's it's uh, it, it's been a uh, a very rich partnership between the National Treasury, SARS. Um, uh, other government departments uh, and the research community in South Africa uh, and internationally, as is reflected by our panelists today, uh, to, to, to focus on some key aspects to add value to, to what we know and uh, what, what, um, what it implies for policymaking about South Africa's uh, inequality situation. And it turns out to be in, an incredibly important context for the broad work of SA Tide, but also context for very specific things. And so we've had um, two key prongs to our, our, our research work. One was about general income and wealth inequality at the household level. How, how is the society working? Um, we, we, uh, have also focused quite hard on how the labor market is actually working. And what we've brought to the South African discussion really is, uh, is the ability to use some of the tax data as well as the other rich survey data that we have in the country to, to try and understand these dynamics uh, in, in very nuanced ways, which is absolutely crucial. Uh, there's, there's international recognition of the importance of of understanding inequality 
as a lens on understanding how the society and its labor markets are actually functioning and, and in order to empower citizens to be as productive as they can be and for a society to flourish. So these issues are crucial. Um, and obviously we've had a key prong on government policies uh, to, uh, to, for inclusive growth. Inequality sits at the heart of mediating between growth and poverty reduction and good social outcomes. And so the inclusivity of growth hinges upon an understanding of inequality. Um, as I said, we've pushed very hard on data and data projects and making them available to the research community. We've also run a number of projects to get, that get stuck into the actual uh, researchers within Treasury and across government uh, in terms of demographic modeling that they've got a very a frontier understanding of what, what the population is doing in our country and a frontier understanding of some of the modeling tools that, can, that they can use in their work to, 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 to plan uh, policies well. Next slide, please. Thanks. So to quickly take you on a, a tour through some of our, our, our big findings. Um, uh, there are many papers at the bottom of my presentation, which we'd be very happy to make available to you. I've got them all listed with the links to the UNU wider website. We're not gonna go there now. I'm doing a very high level review. But, uh, but on the economy and the labor market, it sits center stage actually in, in mediating inequality in South Africa. All the health inequalities, all the, all the education inequalities, all the locational inequalities where you live, uh, have a bearing uh, and, and, and uh, play through the labor market. And we'll only crack our inequality problem through the economy and through the labor market at the end of the day in a sustainable way. We have company tax data uh, available and we've matched that with employee data. Uh, and that really gives us a unique lens that this country hasn't really had before on the demand for labor and also on how our industries and how employment actually happens, how growth happens, how, what the structures of our industries are, how they interact. Uh, do they price by markups? How, how employment happens? It's absolutely fundamental. Um, and we've got a much richer texture out of our, the work in our work stream, but also the whole of SA time about that. And it's not, it's not a simple labor market. We, we, uh, we see, for example, that a lot of the wage setting uh, happen, uh, could be located within firms. In other words, firms have some discretion about how they set their wages and firm specific factors have a, have a play in wage setting. But so too uh, do sectors and, and there's some really excellent work in, in, in the work stream showing that their local level labor market effects as well. If, if industries are very competitive, uh, very uh, non-competitive in a certain area, and, but it's a strongly unionized area that leads to a certain operation of the labor market uh, in that area that's completely crucial to the development of a potential of that area and employment creation in that area. Um, it makes the minimum wage discussion complicated. So, so what, what the work stream has brought to bear is, is the pressing necessity for us to have a, have a realistic, grounded on data picture of how the South African labor market actually works. Not some theoretical fiction, uh, but that grounded picture. Um, and so the minimum wage discussion, some of the papers on that uh, have shown, for example, that, that one needs to look at the impacts of minimum wages in a very dynamic way, that minimum wages themselves uh, do, do not, inexorably lead to losses of jobs. It depends on those local level factors and things, but it also depends uh, in longer run on, uh, on the second round, on the spillovers, on the further investment that might take place. Um, very good work done within the work stream on the employment tax incentive, which is the government policy to try and, to, to try and lower wages for employers uh, in order to stimulate employment. And uh, the work has made an amazing contribution of, of actually uh, um, grounding South Africa's evidence policy on, 
on the ETI on, on best practice. This country deserves best practice methodologies to work out whether the ETI is actually working or not. And it's, a, and it's another complicated story. It's, it's partly working. Um, uh, th these tax data, come COVID-19, and we've got real-time data coming in through the UIF payments and, and through, um, through company submissions um, into the tax data. Uh, and it's the only picture we have of the country's labor market in real time. Um, and I think that the, pro the project was very useful to, um, to, to, the, to the country in trying to articulate uh, the, some of the, the emergency relief measures, but there's much greater potential to exploit that. And that's certainly one of the plans that, that SARS and SA Tide have for the future. Next slide, please. So uh, our, the work program articulates extremely high levels of inequality in income and wealth. We knew that already, but there's a texture to the work that's done. Uh, our group is on the panel today, um, as is uh, Leo, and uh, they can talk to some of the work that they've done, fundamental work in the work program. But there's also work done on the top end of the um, income distribution by Ingrid Woolard and others. Um, that, that's added a lot of texture to what we understand about the, the country. And, and here's the state of the nation from a, a paper that's produced uh, looking using the NITS dynamics. It, it paints a picture of a country um, that has, a, a, has made some progress on poverty alleviation, uh, but we still have, uh, focusing on 2017 now, a large chunk, 42% of South Africans who are chronically poor they poor every single time that this longitudinal survey visits them. Uh, they're trapped in poverty in a sense, and, po and policy must be articulated uh, to, to, to deal with that. But then we have a huge uh, swathe of the country uh, that is uh, not poor, not, um, not necessarily poor in any given period. That's the 19.4%, but extremely vulnerable and precarious and um, and can't invest in the future. Um, and, and so we have a vulnerability in the country and we have people who are, who are just poor, but the next time they're not. So there's this, this uh, vulnerability aspect to life in South Africa that, uh, that the research program fills in a lot of the texture with that on test scores, on health equity, on all sorts of things. There's, there's fine grained data uh, and a thin middle class. And that's one of the key points to note for today's proceedings. A middle class, if you define the middle class in a sense that they can, they can serve the function that a middle class is supposed to serve, they settle, they're forward looking, they're investing in their children, they can buy houses, uh, we've got a very fragile middle class and, a, and, a, and an elite. Uh, so Tomar Piketty, it's an inequality trap where many of our, our citizens can't fulfill their potential for this country and for themselves. So uh, when, when Tomah Piketty gave the, the, Nobel, the Nelson Mandela lecture uh, in 2015, he spoke about South Africa as really top of the class on inequality and is way out of the experience that we can think of. In other words, what we're battling with in the country, well, how come we haven't cracked the back of our inequality? Um, is uh, it, One of the reasons for, for, for that is because of its, its level and the way it reproduces itself and the work stream does a great job of, of articulating that. So the whole is worse than the sum of the parts. I guess that's the point. These inequalities in education and health and in the labor market and in spatial where you live and in your housing and in your water supply um, all intersect to create the situation. So the whole is worse than the sum of the parts. That's me uh, quoting myself. Um, yeah, okay, uh, I'm being chivied. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Uh, this is not a voyeuristic e uh, exercise and it's not an exercise to shout, just shout about the level of inequality. It's, a, it's an exercise to understand our inequality in, in, at the level of detail that we can actually confront it. So here's a slide from the work that was done on the top end incomes. Um, and what it, what's useful here is it's only the, from the 95th percentile upwards. And it, 
basically shows what income sources uh, actually are used, come in, are available to those people at the top end. And this is the, this is the bulk of our tax paying um, individuals in the country. And this is what their income looks like. And so it's very useful to understand this. And it wasn't really understood. We didn't have the information. The project has made great gains in, in detailing these sources of information, in detailing wealth as well. Um, okay, next slide, please. So here's the, it's the final slide and it's the key anchor slide uh, to transition into the session then. Um, it's, it's taken from some work that was uh, actually funded on the fringes of the project by the, the French Development Agency, uh, by, um, by Maya Goldman and Ingrid Willard and the CEQ Institute. But uh, what it shows is that we do have a rich menu of social policies in the country, and they are pretty well targeted to where they're supposed to be. Um, and, and so the slide depicts, uh, you can see, for example, that the, the bulk of educational benefits in, in measured in money terms, uh, spending, if you like, the allocation of our budget is, is appropriately going to the lower deciles. Uh, and you can see that that's true of health as well. Um, and, uh, and social security contributions, uh, free basic services are, are small, but they're not insignificant. They're part of our, our policy landscape. Um, and, and you can see where they sit. Uh, let's turn to the tax side. Uh, focusing on the direct taxes, that's the pink line. You can see that the, the direct taxes are coming from the ninth and the 10th decile, the eighth, ninth and 10th, but predominantly the ninth and the 10th decile. This is our inequality coming, wrapping around. We've got a very narrow tax base because of, of our distribution of income, because of the thin middle class. This is the, this is the context for, for our country. Um, and so, so on the one hand, you, you, we've got quite an extensive social expenditure program that's pretty well targeted. On the other hand, our, uh, uh, and it's doing what it can, but the intersection of these inequalities is not, is not getting any momentum going on inclusive growth. Um, on the other hand, our inequalities are coming around to, 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 to severely limit uh, the, the revenue generation from personal income tax. And that's a dilemma. We're now in a fiscal crisis. COVID has happened. We, our social policies have been absolutely indispensable in coping with COVID. Uh, but we now really have some, some fiscal issues to confront, but we also have, have to confront our inequalities as well. And that's the context for today's session. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Murray, for that insightful presentation. You've given us a lot to think about and uh, to discuss this morning with our panelists. But before we uh, carry on and I introduce our panelists, I think one question for me, just to also look at the overall uh, work stream, uh, the inequality work stream, what would you say are some of the or three or four principal lessons from this work stream that you have found over the past three years? You did mention that you've got a number of papers that you will be sharing um, with us a little later on. Um, we can access those papers as well on the website, but maybe talk to us about the three and four or four uh, principal lessons that you've learned over the past three years. Right, so, so, uh, so one is, is what we're pushing on today. Uh, and, and so we really wanted to do exactly what we're doing this morning because um, we, we need to, uh, government has a, a range of policies that can be tweaked and they can be done better. Right, and so, um, but, uh, and so, the, so, so what we have learned is that there is a high return to getting each of the individual policies working as well as they can. Uh, very good research done on, on how to raise the quality of schooling, for example. Um, uh, improving access to the health system. Uh, those things matter. They're all, but at the end of the day, 
the, a, a key, the key lesson was the one that I flagged in my presentation is that the, the, the whole situation comes together. So there's no magic bullet. That's one of our lessons, right? So, so when we're thinking about policy in the country, uh, we, we do need to improve our the quality of our education. Uh, we do need to look at the coverage of our social protection system, but it's their articulation how inequality works is that all these inequalities intersect to keep us where we are. Um, and so, the, but there's a positive lesson for that in the policy space that if, if the policies can be uh, coordinated, you'll get a very high collective return from, from a set of social policies that are well coordinated and, and designed to articulate together. Uh, that's that's the that's the one lesson. The other lesson is a lesson from the labour market work, is that um, is that is that one shouldn't be narrowly focusing labour market policy on wages. The whole industrial structure, it, uh, employers and employees and the searching unemployed are very active participants. So if government uh, provides a better environment. For work, and we've got very and we've got uh, appropriate um, labour regulations in place to mediate the employer-employee relationship. The the more we can improve the infrastructure and the environment for for business, there will be a response. There will be a response to that. So, so in some senses, uh, the the employment creation discussion needs to think about um, about a a. Um, about a very simple process where they facilitate the employment relationship. Uh, but, but our inherited legacy is a problem in South Africa for bringing in new entrants, small firms, um, uh, the informal sector, formalizing the informal sector. It fa they face many, many tough challenges because of the, the, the institutionalized nature of the way industry happens. Uh, let me just stop there, thanks. Thank you very much, Marie. Now to bring in our panelists this morning, we've got Arup Chatterjee. He's a research manager on wealth inequality at the Southern Center for Inequality Studies at the University of at the Wits at Wits University, and Mamiki Liolo, a senior official at the South African Revenue Service. And we also have Leo Chaitka, is a PhD candidate in economics at UC Lorraine, is also a research fellow of the World Inequality Lab. So they've got a lot of wealth, they've got a lot a wealth of knowledge around this topic of inequality today. So to kick things off, I'd like to get a few pointers from our panelists today, what they thought of the presentation that was uh, presented or the synthesis presentation that Murray gave a little earlier on. I'll start off with you about this presentation. Apologies, uh, Mashudi, if you can maybe just uh, repeat your question. So there was a bit of a disturbance in our transmission. Oh, sorry about that, Mamiki. I just wanted to get your thoughts around um, the presentation that Murray uh, presented to us a little earlier on. Okay, so I think um, how SARS fits into this discussion around inequality would probably be the, the, starting, the best starting point um, from our perspective. Um, as Maria has already indicated that our ITSAS's involvement is that we're providing um, tax, anonymized tax administration data to this SA type program. This allows us to sort of build um, a panel data set that can be used by researchers, can be used by policymakers to start informing um, decisions. So we uh, are feeding into the various work streams that are part of the SA Tide program. And uh, first of all, to, as I've just mentioned now, that we give access to individual and firm level taxpayer data for research use. And what the goal there is to create a well documented longitudinal uh, data sets with key variables that can be augmented with research topic specific variables. Now, why I mentioned that is this because. Uh, as, as Prof has already indicated that it's now useful for us to start linking employment data, company data, firm level data, and start assessing what is working in South Africa, where are we good at, and where are we still needing to improve? And I think for us, um, 
as, as Prof has indicated that uh, the, the whole is worse than the sum of the parts, that areas where we are intervening on uh, may seem to be addressing some of the uh, social inequalities that we were tracking over time. And then some, some of the programs that are being implemented may seem to be targeting uh, specific areas of intervention. But I think overall, we'd want to see that these programs are starting to translate to the growth of the economy, uh, to the growth of the cake, to the side, the growth of the size of the cake, so that on the other side, on the income side, on the overall budget side, that on the size side, we can also start collecting more taxes to enable and allow those who are still on the lower end of the scale to be uplifted, to provide more social net and give upliftment to those that require assistance from the state. So I think for us, um, the, the studies such as this sort of give us an impetus to understand what is going on with regards to our, our base our South African tax base or our, our overall national base of uh, human capital. And it also gives us a sense of what are then the, um, uh, what are the income priorities that government needs to start, start looking into, particularly our role as SARS to bring in the necessary revenue that can then assist these uh, social programs that, have, uh, that are, we are now understand, understudying today and discussing today. I think I'll pause here, Mashudu. Thank you so much, Mamiki Aruk. Thanks very much. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So yeah, just to respond to uh, to, to Murray's uh, synthesis, I mean, the first thing to say is congratulations to, to Murray and all the partners on, on really driving a crucial agenda um, that covers a lot of research. Uh, and I think this, it's the synthesis of it that makes it really powerful. Uh, w one of the clear areas that came out was the importance of data uh, and how um, Mamaki mentioned uh, the use of, of SARS administrative data, but how, is, how this has been so key to understanding um, not only uh, specific um, spheres in and of themselves, but the relationships between, uh, between those spheres. And I think that's why inequality more broadly is a really crucial way of understanding some of the uh, societal concerns that uh, exist in South Africa, because you're able to explore those relationships, you're able to look at uh, some of the causal mechanisms that are further up the, the chain rather than uh, with the issue in and of itself. Uh, so, so I look forward uh, to seeing how this uh, project continues um, and seeing what uh, more data um, may come out of, uh, out of the of various administrative bodies uh, to see how some of the analysis and research can progress. And just to say congratulations again to everyone involved with the SATI project. Thank you so much, Arup. The last person would be um, get some insights from Leo on what he thought of the synthesis presentation. Uh, thank you very much for inviting and uh, and congratulations again for this uh, type of, I mean, for all the works uh, achieved. I think, well, it's all encompassing. And so there are many, many, many issues um, that are tackled here. I think this idea that uh, there's no silver bullet is, uh, which was mentioned by uh, Murray, I think is, uh, is a good starting point to try to uh, address the issue. I think also in general, it's uh, one has to reckon that it's, very hard to uh, curb such uh, high inequality. And so that all instruments, all policy instruments should be considered and uh, in, a, in sort of a cons consistent policy package. I really, uh, I'm really aligned with such message. Um, and maybe I would stress um, maybe one thing in particular is that uh, if you want to precisely target your policy and adjust your policy and measure also the impact i wouldn't uh, i cannot stress uh, enough the necessity for uh, researchers and policymakers to have in general better data i mean i think south africa is already pretty well placed here there's i mean all this research effort would not have been possible without 
access to better data. But I think one key message also I'd like to I'd like to stress on is that um, data is precise data and match like employer employees thing, things like that uh, are key to solve such problems. Thank you very much, Leo. We can start kickstart the conversation really uh, today, looking at uh, inequality. Thank you to everyone who's uh, given uh, their thoughts around the synthesis presentation that was presented by Murray. So we know that the pandemic has led the the current pandemic that we find ourselves in has led to a sharp decline in tax revenues and in this environment. Are there feasible previously underutilized areas or from where additional tax revenues can be sought? I think this is a question that we directed to Mamiki and anyone on the panel who, who would like to respond to this. Okay. Um, I think around the world, there is a general acknowledgement that um, that the COVID-19 pandemic has done quite a bit of damage, not only to the economy, but to, uh, to other societal um, factors, health, um, mortality rates, etc. cetera. Um, in our space, uh, I'll only speak uh, with regards to SARS. Um, in our space, of course, that has put a strain in terms of uh, revenue collections. Um, it has also put a strain on many other things that we have to administer uh, as, as, a, as the agency administering on behalf of the ministry. Um, I think for us, um, there are lots of lessons that we've taken through, I've taken from last year uh, with regards to COVID-19. And uh, there are certain um, strategic decisions that we've taken that allow us to move on forward to see how we best deal with the challenges that have been posed by the pandemic. So if I just maybe give a quick uh, overview of the our annual performance plan for 2021, uh, we still um, continue on the path of encouraging voluntary compliance amongst the taxpayers uh, with the idea that we exist for a, to serve a higher purpose, that is to enable government to build a capable state that fosters sustainable economic growth and social, social development that serves the well-being of all South Africans. So this is a cornerstone of the work that we do. Um, and in terms of our vision 2024 to be a smart modern SARS with unquestionable integrity and, and to be trusted and admired, there are certain building blocks that we are explicitly working on. There are about nine strategic objectives that we're working on. I'll just maybe uh, pause and just highlight the fifth one uh, that talks about SARS's um, uh, employing smart leverage in terms of uh, um, ability to uh, SARS's ability to uh, extract value from our data. And in terms of that, that's objective, strategic objective number five. And I'll just quickly highlight to you what, what it entails is the increased use of data to improve the integrity, to derive insights and improve outcomes. And here we're expanding in the, uh, and increasing the use of data, data analytics, artificial intelligence, to create capability to understand the compliance behavior of taxpayers and to provide clarity, certainty, and certainty where needed to make it easy and seamless to provide our services, to, to foster voluntary compliance, and then to also be able to detect risks and trends and instances of non-compliance so that we can enforce responsibly. And why I'm mentioning this is because, uh, as, as uh, I think Arup has, has mentioned, that the, the data has, the use of the data sort of has multiple uses across the many different value chains of uh, policy decision policy making. So for us, being able to plug in into the area where we know there is a dire need, and that is data, data that can be uh, tracked over time, data that can be used meaningfully to make um, informed decision and evidence-based decisions. So for us, we, uh, we've we put that as part of our explicit objective number five to try and make sure that when we do try and make it easy for you to, co to comply with your tax affairs, when we do make it easy for us to service you, when, and when we're dealing with those that are non-compliant, that we are based on some level of um, data and information and intelligence so that there is a le level of, of fairness to the process and there's a level of, um, let's call it a scholarly rigor to the work that we do. 
So I think for us, when we are now preparing ourselves to, I'm not gonna call it post COVID because we're all going through different waves of the pandemic that having gone through last year, we are now sort of trying to see what do we need to reinforce as part of our working package and what do we need to bring on board that probably is new that perhaps last year or year ago or two years ago was not something in our thinking framework. Thank you. Thanks, Mamiki. Before you respond, Arukpan, to some of the additional tax revenue measures that could be sought uh, by government, I'd like to invite our audience members to also be part of the conversation this morning to put your questions in the chat box or raise your hand so that the panelists can respond to any questions that you might have uh, for them this afternoon. So all of you are very welcome uh, to do so this morning. Um, Arukpan, Maybe we go back to the question that I posed to Mamiki and she um, responded to um, quite lengthily. Maybe you've got something to add to it. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, and, and I think it's a crucial question uh, at, this, at this point in time. So as Murray mentioned uh, in his uh, presentation, especially bringing out some of the uh, CEQ analysis, a lot of the tax revenues are based uh, on on taxing flows and of course over the course of the pandemic uh, this has drastically been affected so one way of searching for for underutilized areas is perhaps switching from from flows to stocks uh, in an attempt to perhaps access balance sheets to find these resources now as part of the SA tide uh, project uh, leo uh, amory and myself we we estimated the distribution of household wealth in, in South Africa, which is um, one of these uh, sort of balance sheets, a household sector balance sheet. And, uh, and we were able to do this because of, uh, because of the administrative data that came into the project that allowed us to, to provide uh, a, a much more accurate estimate, uh, even if there's room for, for more data and more, more accuracy. And so uh, this paper, I think, is available on, on the SA Tide website, but just to give you a broad a sense of what we found, uh, we found that the top 10% uh, of, um, of people in terms of, on, in terms of wealth, they owned 86% of all the wealth in South Africa. Um, and, and that gets more concentrated as we go up. So as an example, the top 0.01% uh, had a 15% share. And on, uh, th this is about three five hundred people, uh, three thousand five hundred people, and on average, this is um, each person uh, had ownership of around four hundred eighty-six uh, million rand. But that's that's average. And then on, on the opposite side, you know, the bottom fifty percent on average were in in net debt or had no wealth, um, so to speak of. So, so this estimate, uh, of course, this is an estimate, it's not audited numbers, and this can improve, of course, with the more and more data that comes out, uh, and hopefully more data that comes out from SARS as well. But, uh, but at the, at, if, we, if we take into account uh, some of the other sources that are available, our estimates are roughly in line with, um, with their estimates. So as an example, Afrasia, we underestimate that concentration in relation to Afrasia. So, uh, so we think this is a good base uh, on which to estimate that, that wealth distribution. Uh, and in relation to the question, I think the, the useful uh, thing about this estimate is that it provides some info about a potential tax base. Um, so perhaps as you know, uh, we also on the back of this proposed that in this circumstance, um, a tax on this asset base uh, on this, uh, on this, uh, what we call a wealth tax, um, it could be a useful policy proposal uh, to help fund some of the urgent and continuing needs um, during uh, during COVID, during the pandemic, and the urgent social um, needs that that Murray and other excellent researchers have have demonstrated. Now, of course, this is a this is a hugely polarizing debate, um, and I think there's a lot of strong a priori beliefs. But one of, the, one of the key things that hopefully we've been able to provide is some data to at least move some of the debates along a little bit. And so based on this tax base that we estimated, uh, you know, we think that we could, uh, that, that a potential tax like this could raise um, somewhere between 70 and 160 billion rands. That's 1.5% to 3.5% of GDP. 
and that's with taking into account um, between 15% to 50% uh, of, of evasion and avoidance. So we have very conservative estimates. And, and our position is that, of course, there are challenges to this, um, implementation challenges. Um, but, uh, but on two points, we think that firstly, because uh, of the deep financial markets and the proactive systems that have been put into place, both by Saab and the Reserve Bank, South Africa is actually relatively well placed um, to, to develop the systems with, of course, with polit political support um, and with, with investment, but also the potential revenue that could be raised in such an urgent situation uh, is something that should lead uh, at least to this policy being put on the table and, and discussed. Um, le but let me not talk any more about the wealth tax. I think there's, uh, you know, we've got a, a paper that's also out there and, um, and a tool that can, that can help you play around with rates and, and estimate what sort of revenue you can get. One of the, I think one of the crucial things that we're also trying to say is that if you change the perspective of the tax system um, to, to look at wealth rather than labor market income, then this opens up different avenues uh, that could be that could be utilized, explored at the very least. And uh, and one of these examples is, is dividends, tax, perhaps um, other things are uh, looking at exemptions that are in place for pensions, um, looking at estate duty, and and broadly thinking about the distribution uh, when focusing at the top end. So, you know, some other excellent research that was done um, in this inequality stream by Bassier and Willard, um, when looking at the income distribution, um, they note that the growth in the top incomes versus a stagnant middle is due to capital incomes. So that's incomes from wealth. So taking the perspective of wealth uh, could lead to uh, looking at potential resources for taxation um, that up until now have been focused uh, on, on the income inequality um, from primarily from, from labor market incomes. So yeah, let me leave it there. Thank you so much, Arup. I know Leo as well. You've been quite integral in uh, in, in in this paper that uh, Arup is talking about. Is there anything more that you'd like to add when we was talk to the the question on additional tax revenues that could be sought from the South African taxpayer? Uh, yes. Well, Arup mentioned all the essential points. Maybe uh, and and it's true that. Uh, my presence for this uh, dialogue is essentially justified uh, by the fact that we've studied the distribution of wealth and we've tried to estimate uh, how much could be collected by implementing a, a progressive wealth tax. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, the, the thing I can really defend is that indeed, I, I strongly believe that this is an avenue that should be considered. And the figures we provide are here precisely to give an idea, a rough idea, uh, that despite all the uncertainties we have about how people will react and even the underlying distributions, we have good reason to think that this would generate uh, no, I mean, uh, some significant tax revenues. And so I think this proposal should really be on the table. Maybe, maybe it's complicated for now. Maybe uh, it cannot really be implemented the way we wish it would be, that sort of things. But I think this, there's really an avenue for policymaking there. And I just would like to mention the fact that, uh, I mean, there has been some historical cases in Europe. Uh, there's still a wealth tax in Colombia now. And for instance, Argentina, I mean, of course, like these are different settings and maybe sometimes the context are not really, uh, you cannot really compare them. And so it's hard to derive like any lesson from a complete different context, but just to keep in mind that Argentina, as a response to the COVID crisis, has implemented a wealth tax on the 0.8%. So it's like very similar to what we propose. And I mean, the tax base is not exactly the same and there was not yet any report giving all the details so that we can really compare what we propose with what they did. But just in general, they did, they did this and it, they, they managed to collect some, uh, some uh, sizable amount of revenues, even a little bit more than they expected. So it's an experience that shows that 
despite what people sometimes think, but without much data about this, uh, when you have attacks like that, not everybody goes away, not everybody flies, not, not investment do, do not stop suddenly, that sort of thing. So uh, I would like to warn people having these ideas about uh, the reaction to a wealth tax that, of course, some people might react and of course it provides some disincentive in some regards, but sometimes the benefit uh, overtake the, the, the cost. And so I think it should be considered precisely and not just in light of some general ideas that we have about how people will react. I think Mami Ki will welcome the extra revenue that would come from the wealth tech. Maybe I'll bring it back to Mami Ki and ask what kind of talks are they having within SARS on this wealth tax? I know that uh, National Treasury would need to pronounce on the policy around it, but maybe at SARS, what kind of conversations are being had around the wealth tax? Uh, I think Mashudu here, um, I would definitely defer this back to National Treasury for them to give a perspective on. Uh, I think from SARS's perspective, uh, any revenue opportunities that uh, present themselves, we will pursue pursue them to the full extent, to the full extent that the law permits us to do so, to, to the full, full extent that the fiscal policy allows us to do so. But I think uh, it would be premature of me to sort of make a pronouncement on behalf of SARS on tax policy matters. I am aware that we may have one or two colleagues from Treasury that are part of this discussion. Perhaps they may want to step in and just give a sense of how far conversations are going uh, so that I don't um, make pronouncements that I'm not, uh, I don't have the authority to do so. Indeed. Thank you so much for that, Mamiki. I know I've just seen my colleague, uh, Chris Axelson, um, join the uh, platform. Maybe he'd like to uh, respond to the question on the wealth tax and how far those conversations are going. We just asked Grace maybe to also just give uh, Chris um, some the, the hosting rights so he's able to respond to the question around uh, wealth tax. I'm not sure if Chris, um, he does have co-hosting rights and he'll be able to respond to that. Uh, Chris, can we um, throw it to you and just to get an idea of how far the wealth tax conversations are uh, at this point within National Treasury? Hi, Mashudu. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry, I've joined late. So I'm in another meeting. Um, put me on the spot here. Yeah. But, you know, internally, we are looking at this issue. Um, the OECD has done quite a bit of work. There's this nice work that's been done by Arup and colleagues um, in terms of trying to get an overall estimate of net wealth. Um, if there have been a few papers which we look at quite closely to see, well, you know, how do these correlate with what we see and what we think about the total stock of wealth that is that is out there? Um, but it's very much trying to, you know, we're investigating this to see if we can come up with an internal position. You know, the minister hasn't stated anything um, publicly on this, other than the fact that we are looking um, into these types of issues. You know, there are a lot of wealth taxes already in South Africa. Um, and so we also look at those trying to quantify, see how we compare with other countries. Um, it's quite a complicated issue. And we also need to look at um, from SARS's perspective in terms of how possible this is to do. Um, you know, SARS have had some difficult times in the recent past. And you can see it and its impacts on revenue collections. And you know, SARS are focusing on their primary core mandate with the taxes that are there available at the moment. So we do also have to take into account the administrative um, consequences of following a completely new tax base. So we're, we're researching, we're looking at all these issues. I think these types of debates are very uh, useful for us so that we can get a different perspective. Um, and then we can try and provide a, you know, an analysis and a view that we can put forward to our um, political superiors. And that's basically how far we are at the moment. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but well, well, you've responded to it quite well. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. And to our audience members, feel please, please feel free uh, to put your questions in the chat box or raise your hand for our panelists this, uh, this morning. They're all available to respond to your question. And another, uh, we've got a hand up, but thank you so much from Andrew. Don, um, just check your name properly. I just want to get your name. Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much, Andrew. You can post your question to the panelists. Thanks. 
Hello, yes. Um, I, I want to ask something about sort of the the underlying public finance theory here. So, so one of the first things you learn as an undergraduate, sort of studying public economics or tax 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 economics, is that uh, you know a, a, that that a comprehensive income tax incorporates a wealth tax. Uh, if you make, I mean, obviously you make very simplified assumptions in that. So, but if you have a, a simplified assumption about uh, the, the state of the economy uh, and the generalization of returns on assets, then uh, then 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 when you're taxing income fully, you're effectively also taxing the the asset base that underlies that that income. Now, obviously, the world is much more complicated than that, and so in practice, that's not what we have. In practice, we have uh, a struck, uh, income tax that is that is more narrowly defined and a range, as Chris has indicated, of uh, of supplementary taxes. We have a capital gains tax. We have a tax on on residential property that goes to municipalities. Uh, uh, some of our transfer taxes are kind of like uh, wealth taxes, although they're very imperfect. So, so what what most countries have is uh, an income tax that is incomplete, and then some supplementary taxes. Uh, that uh, that, are, that are targeted at various forms of wealth. Um, what's being proposed is, you know, rather than continue with that reform on which we've made quite a lot of progress over the last 30 years, we've introduced capital gains tax, we've stepped up those rates, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that what's being proposed is that we should rather put our eggs in the comprehensive definition of wealth uh, and, uh, and 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 tax that at a flat rate. It's extraordinarily difficult to do, uh, and in South Africa, it faces the immense problem that a lot of South African wealth is holdings of foreign assets, and of course, about half of the South African economy, uh, if you like, the wealth that underpins South African GDP, is owned by foreigners. So, 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 so you've got a whole lot of very complicated cross-border things that you're trying to do here. Uh, and so my question to Arup uh, and Leo is, you know, why would you really want to opt for something so hard rather than to continue with the progressive st strengthening of uh, our, our, our income tax system and its, and, and, and its complementary taxes, uh, which is, if you like, the, the, the path that we've been on underway for the last little last few years and uh, and 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 that has the support of 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 uh, of, of international tax advice so. thanks andrew you can maybe uh, maybe i'll take this one thank you very much for your question and uh, um so there's a couple of points to this um so first i, I i'd like to make a disclaimer here, I'm not exactly sure I understand what you mean by uh, a complete income tax would encompass uh, a tax on wealth, uh, because you can think of, uh, well, typically a wealth tax that uh, would achieve some collection that cannot be done through income tax. So maybe it's, it's um, you mean that a complete tax on income uh, allows to tax future capital accumulation, but not past capital accumulation. So that's that's one point. You can still, in a way, do more with a wealth tax than you can do with a fully uh, with a full income tax. Um, now, I think there's a in in a way that's maybe the first element of your question is in terms of uh, responding to a crisis that affects the flows. And that's what uh, Arup was mentioning. Uh, our idea here is that you might have some interest in uh, looking for resources that are in the stock, uh, rather than wait for the flows to um, to uh, to be renewed, uh, given that you're facing a crisis that affects them. So that's uh, to me that's a good reason uh, to maybe dig this dig that uh, policy issue. And in fact, historically, it's been implemented uh, in many cases as a means to uh, mobilize sort of resources accumulated in the past, but unevenly distributed across the population, mobilize them through uh, taxation to allow uh, investment. 
and so on to allow investment as a response to a crisis, such as, for instance, World War II. Uh, well, Germany implemented wealth tax as a response to this, for instance. Um, so there's still, um, uh, I think, a key difference between taxing income and taxing wealth uh, when you try to answer such a, such a, such a crisis. And I think it should be kept in mind uh, when advocating for one for the other. Um, now, our estimates take into account the fact that uh, wealth is being held by, the, by foreigners. So uh, I also want to stress here that uh, we do not include this wealth into our estimates. So normally, I mean, maybe, it's a, maybe we're underestimating this share, but we are using like SARP, da uh, SARP data. And so normally we're not uh, sort of putting forward a policy proposal that would uh, imply being able to tax wealth uh, held uh, by foreign citizens. Um, and now regarding the fact that it's complicated, this, I, I mean, I com uh, we completely um, acknowledge that this is indeed complicated, but and, uh, and maybe in, in a way, in the beginning, uh, one would not be able at all to implement uh, a wealth tax, the ideal wealth tax, you know, the one that would uh, apply to the entire uh, tax base and, uh, um, and take into account debt and things like that. So we recognize that it is indeed complicated. Um, however, I think it would be interesting to still work in that direction uh, if we have a upcoming paper that is unfortunately not yet available for, for reading, but, and we see that the, if you look at the distribution of, of uh, tax paid by people as a uh, function of their wealth, we see that it's largely regressive, meaning that people with more wealth tend to uh, uh, pay a smaller share of um, uh, taxes as, as a proportion to their wealth then uh, so richer people tend to pay a smaller share of uh, taxes as a proportion to their wealth than uh, poor people and but wealth is an ability to pay tax as well right so uh, in a way there's also a matter of uh, making the system more overall uh, progressive i think there's this case this argument also that uh, need to be uh, thought of uh, we don't have Unfortunately, figures yet to really uh, to really show show you this, but uh, it's been pointed out in other contexts, such as in the U.S., for instance. Um, I mean, I'm taking a lot of time to answer this. It was a like, I could I could add a, a few few things more, but maybe I I can hand in the yeah the mic. All right. Thank you so much, Leo. We've got more questions coming through from our audience. We'll start off with uh, Marlies, uh, Marlies Piet, I hope I'm um, pronouncing your name correctly. And then we'll also take uh, C. Viresh. Um, so we'll do those two questions and then we'll get the panelists to respond. And then we'll do the questions in the chat box um, afterwards. Thank you. Great. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, briefly, one comment uh, to um, what Leo just said. So in the tax data, um, we have a variable which um, it indicates whether the submission made use of a tax practitioner, uh, number one. And number two, um, we have an identifier, anonymized identifier of this tax practitioner. So um, I think one way um, going forward, what SARS could potentially do, and I'm not sure whether they're already doing something like that, but you know, once um, they realize um, that a particular tax practitioner is using one way of doing uh, decreasing tax liability, um, that it could potentially then trigger um, audits for tax submissions by the same tax practitioner. Um, that is maybe one thing that we could potentially look at. Um, so essentially look at a tax practitioner uh, effect um, number one, do you use make use of a tax practitioner? Yes, no. And then also just um, see whether um, it's linked and whether the tax practitioner uses the same methodology uh, across his clients. Um, that's just something that jumped uh, to mind. And then um, two questions that I have, one for Mami Ki and one for Chris. Um, Chris, um, I know we've spoken a little bit about this. Um, so obviously there was a a new tax bracket that was introduced um, a couple of years ago. 
Um, and I know if you have um, started looking at the analysis, what the effect was that. Um, yeah, if you could maybe share just some of the results that you have. Um, and maybe based on that, um, where do you think are we on the, La uh, on the Laffer curve? That was my one question. And then the other question is for Mamiki. Um, so, you know, during this conversation, we've been speaking about the availability of tax data, and it's been an enormous effort, um, and it's, it's, been, it's been so wonderful. Um, and I have two questions. Um, how do we ensure that we uh, can get more accurate data going forward? Um, and obviously, only that is what is submitted to SARS is the data that SARS receives and that we that we get and can use for the analysis. So my question is, um, how do we ensure and implement new systems at SARS uh, that can verify more information uh, that is submitted to SARS? Um, so one way, for instance, is doing um, integrated e-invoicing tax systems where, you know, if a company says we paid uh, 20,000 Rand in rental, um, that you can actually verify that information automatically because the company uh, who received the rental income, for instance, uh, they would also indicate it as, uh, as income. And obviously then just checking how reliable is, is the information. Um, so that way we get uh, can improve tax compliance, number one. And number two, we get uh, better data. Um, those are just some of the, the initial thoughts. Thank you so, so much. It's been so wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Margis. See, Viresh, you can pose your question so that the panelists can respond. Hello, everyone. I think the analysis of wealth tax is here, is the normative approach, but uh, the empirical analysis too needed for uh, decentralization of wealth to, me to meet the volatility in economic spheres, because the COVID pandemic has revealed the weakness existing, the straight actions, uh, because the many of the states in developing countries and, uh, and many other third world countries are faced uh, the many difficulties to meet the uh, the social aspiration of the underprivileged section. I think even though we have the uh, the holistic approach to the uh, the wealth tax, the progressive tax is it, I, I had no uh, basically I had no optimistic about the the progress wealth tax because in many countries it is not uh, working good for the decentralization or redistribution of wealth to the uh, the real uh, the poor peoples uh, to upgrading their life conditions and other employment situation are not working properly because we need uh, there is an alternative approaches or uh, the implication of the wealth tax in adopting or embracing in many of the countries is too needed uh, because uh, the excessive influence of the multinational companies the state governments or the any form of governments are facing uh, the difficulties to exercise their functions in a holistic manner. Thank you. Thank you, Sivaresh. I hope the panelists were able to hear um, Sivaresh because there was a bit of an interruption um, in his line. Thank you so much. I think Mamiki, you've got a question that was posed to you as well as uh, Chris, you can take it away, thanks. Okay. Um, yes, uh, unfortunately for C. Viresh, I, I, I struggled to hear what he was asking. So I'll probably first deal with uh, Marlise's questions uh, um, regarding the availability of data, how to ensure that we've got more accurate information. So um, maybe if I can just take you through some of the things that uh, SARS has put through, forward in its um, annual performance plan uh, in terms of the first three objectives. Um, I may have quickly spoken through it, but maybe just to give you a context of what it means. When we're saying providing clarity and certainty for taxpayers and traders of their tax obligations, this means that we make sure that when people engage in the tax products that we administer, we give them the necessary 
uh, education necessary information so that when they start filling in the forms the way they're supposed to fill them they know what they're supposed to submit to us and that information is in fact correct so there is a whole set subset of activities that we are undertaking just to make sure that we deal with that particular objective of um providing clarity and certainty to taxpayers and traders. Then the next one is making it easy for people to comply with the tax obligations. Obviously, this means that whether they are interfacing with us um, online, they're interfacing with us through e-filing, um, doing and trying to sort of minimize our face-to-face -face visits, but at any point of interaction that we have with the taxpayers, that it should be easy for them to interact with us. And one of the things, as an example, that we've introduced to make sure that we do have um, a lot more accurate information is that we introduced uh, auto assessments. So those of you who've just gone past uh, through with us in the past filing season know that uh, you would have received a message from SARS saying that with auto assessed due this is what we think your tax um, affairs are or your tax obligations are it indicate that you agree or you don't agree with this and for us to be able to do that we obviously have to get a lot of third party data so there is a lot of um, um, information that we gather on behalf of taxpayers and we sort of link up a lot of data points so that by the time you interact with us, we're able to already tell you what we know about your entire um, tax, tax situation or your tax profile. So how do we ensure that we get more accurate data for in introducing um, such measures would obviously allow us to do so. Um, the third objective that we've got in place is to make sure that we detect those people who are not complying and make it so hard for them and make it so costly for them so that by the time we sort of catch them either early on in the commission of the crime or later on that well or tax non tax compliance that we already are putting together lots of information that allows us to then say you should have complied and this is what you're being punished for um the Fourth, fifth objective that I've already touched on is the make increased use of data to improve our uh, um, integrity and to derive insights. But I think more importantly, number six, it's modernizing our systems to provide digital and streamlined services. And I think for us, that's a very important thing to mention that we are in starting to invest quite heavily in making sure that our, our systems are modernized and that we can sort of have a, almost like a live connection to what our taxpayers are doing and be able to collect that information and be able to build a much more comprehensive picture about the taxpayers. This allows us then to do many, many things such as behavioral, economic, social uh, data analysis um, so that we can in fact um, profile things like behavior according to tax practitioners behavior according to a group of taxpayers behavior according to localities behaviors according to many many different dimensions so all of that is, as we are sort of uh, investing in both our capacity capability human capability and also our infrastructure our data our system that we will be able to incrementally work towards making sure that we encourage people to almost um voluntarily comply because they know that SARS has an eye in, in uh, tentacles all over the data sets that um, tell us a story about the text picture. I trust that that, that maybe that, that helps in sort of giving um, perspective on that. And with regards to integrated systems like e-invoicing, e yes, I think there's a whole lot of um, solutions that are in place that we would need to obviously make sure that we plug and play into our system what is uh, suitable for South African environment, what SARS can handle in terms of its systems, but it's definitely um, integrated systems is definitely what is in our in our in our performance plans. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Miki. I uh, will get Chris to respond. Um, and then we've also got questions in the chat box. So just also just mindful of the time. We'll go through the question in the chat box a little later on as soon as uh, Chris uh, responds to this question. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mashidi. So um, the first question was just on the new tax back of 45% and what happened there. Um, so I, I can't come out and state um, results just yet. Um, we're still working on it and I think it should actually also be approved. It's, it could be a bit of a sensitive one. Um, but to say that there definitely was a behavioral response, I mean, that was quite sure that we did see that. And we have mentioned in some of the budget documentation that we published that we didn't get as much revenue as we thought we would from these um, personal income tax changes. So that can sort of show you 
uh, give you a small sort of insight into it. If you look at some of the other research that's been done, um, Kemp did a paper on the taxable income elasticity. And on that one, he thought that the top rate of just below 45 was sort of as high as you can go, um, which flows into your next question on the Laffer curve. I mean, I think in public discourse, this isn't spoken about too well. Um, you can have Laffer curves amongst particular tax instruments, but not overall. So if you look at, for example, the top tax rate, you know, if there is a behavioral response and people do try and shelter incomes at the top end, you might well um, get close to or experience effects of a Laffer curve. But then if you look at raising revenue from personal income tax, say through not adjusting the brackets for inflation, um, the behavioral response is a lot lower and then you don't have as much of a Laffer curve. And the same goes for VAT and the fuel levy and other things. So there's certainly, it's not a case where if you raise taxes, you won't get any additional revenue amongst all the instruments. It's You, you really do have to look at it uh, specifically. Um, just to add on as well there, I mean, even if you do this analysis on the taxable income elasticity and you see that, well, perhaps we are at the 45%, maybe it's at the, the peak of what it should be in terms of the Laffer curve. It's so dependent on what your tax base is. So, you know, if you have, and we did have quite a lot of deductions available at the time, and then individuals use those deductions to reduce their taxable income, suddenly you're not getting as much tax then. But if you were to restrict those, which is sort of part of what Andrew was saying, um, and then you do another increase later on, the elasticity would be different and you might not be at that level of the, of the Laffer curve. So it's very dependent on what we actually do with the tax base. And we've been pushing forward um, proposals to try and broaden the tax base and reduce a lot of these deductions and incentives. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out from Andrew's question was, and this equivalence between a net wealth tax and comprehensive income tax. And you can look at it as being exactly the same thing. If you can tax all the gains to wealth, it will be equivalent to a particular level of a wealth tax. And that's why the OECD come out and they say, if you've got a very comprehensive income tax and you tax almost all those gains from wealth, then there isn't as much need for a net wealth tax. However, if you don't have a comprehensive income tax base and you don't tax the comprehensive income well, then there is more of a justification for a wealth tax. And I think it's useful to have those, um, you know, that sort of insight and applicable when we think about this policy. Um, the other thing is also, as Mamaki was saying, which we mentioned in the budget was, SARS are really trying to actually just boost their overall information about wealth using information they get from other countries, using third party information that we get from banks and others. Because if you've got a better insight into overall wealth, which is what we need anyway, um, then you can also have a better insight into what those income should be and you can audit the high wealth individuals better and try and get a greater tax on all that income. So there is definitely benefits for us trying to at least get a picture of, a better picture of, of wealth in the country, thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. So we'll just respond to Isan Basir's questions. He's got a number of questions on the chat box. I'm not sure if Leo and uh, Arup have already uh, read the questions in the, um, the chat box or whether you'd like me to repeat them to you. And we also just need to also just um, keep our responses short so we can wrap up the conversation. It has been going on for um, a little bit over our time. I'm not sure, Leo and Arup, have you had a look at the questions in the chat box? I have, uh, but Arup, I think you were raising your hand. So just if, oh, okay. if you want to come up, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just um, a, a sort of general response to the comments before. Um, so, so of course, there is this debate about uh, the, the equivalence uh, between capital incomes tax and, and wealth. And, I, uh, and I, I completely agree with Chris that, A, it's a discussion that needs to be had. And, um, and I think that w one of the key points I just want to raise is I think that the data systems that are required to improve uh, capital incomes tax are um you know are ex are almost identical to the ones that are needed to understand the asset base which uh which would also um be needed for for a wealth tax so i think just to reiterate i think that one of the key points that's coming from us is about is that we fully support this um the development uh, and the capacity investment in in data systems for this regard i think you know 
one of the challenges around capital income taxes, as Leo mentioned, is that um, it's not an event um, that the administration can rely on. Um, and as with any tax, including a wealth tax, there are also avoidance and evasion strategies for that. So, um, so as an example, declaring dividends may be delayed and you go in, uh, that, that money goes into retained earnings um, and, and other similar strategies like that. Um, so, so I think, you know, there is a debate uh, that needs to be had in that regard. Um, but the reason why we proposed this, this tax at this point in time, as Leo mentioned, is because the flows have, have dried up. And I, I think a final point, just to say, taking dividends tax as an example, um, that's at a rate of, of 20%, that's flat, that um, only looks at the dividend that's been declared. So um, there, there's a lot of room there to develop that um, because as it is now, it contributes to the regressivity at the top end of the distribution. Um, having information about the total wealth of the, uh, of the person who is declaring that dividend will then allow you to understand at what rates you can, uh, you can make a dividend tax to make it progressive. Um, but it's precisely things like a, a flat rate on, on the dividend tax that makes, uh, that makes the overall tax system um, slightly regressive at the top. Um, I think th there was also um, another question um, uh, from uh, C. Viresh, um, or it was, perhaps it was a comment, um, but yeah, I, from what I heard, I'd just like to respond to it, but I think every country has its, has its uh, specificities. And I, I think one of the things that we're trying to uh, demonstrate is, is that South Africa, relative to, to other, I mean, severe said developing countries, but relative to certain other countries is less data rich, but compared to many others is, is more data rich. And I think this can really help um, when it comes to understanding that an implementation of, uh, of a wealth tax, but also just a general tax um, a set of taxes. SARS has, got, uh, has done an incredible job over the last you know, a decade and more in developing those systems. So I think the situation in South Africa is slightly different uh, in that regard. Uh, and, and how successful redistribution is, is also um, needs analysis on the expenditure side and, and whether the policies, uh, even if there is expenditure, if they're the right policies. Um, so th that question I think is, is more complex um, and needs a, a much more in-depth uh, analysis. Which, which hopefully is what SATI is doing. Um, I think Leo wanted to respond to Isan, so let me hand over. Before Leo um, uh, responds uh, to Isan's um, uh, questions in the chat box, I'd like to say a big thank you to Murray. He has to step off the, the platform. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation a little earlier on, Murray, and thank you for your time this morning. So we'll just keep... Uh, Arup, Leo and Mimiki, and as well as Chris for another couple of minutes to respond to the questions in the chat box and then we'll definitely close the conversation. Thank you so much, Murray, for attending today. Thank you all very, very much. Cheers. Cheers. You can go ahead, Leo. Okay, um, so maybe just to save time, so I'll, I'll try to respond like as quickly as possible on the three points and maybe make a last comment about this comparison between capital, uh, between wealth tax and uh, comprehensive income tax. So first thing about monitoring compliance, so maybe I can read the questions so that, uh, so it's about our wealth tax proposal, about our estimates, uh, and the first question is about, um, what can we say about monitoring compliance? Um, so that's a bit general. So um, just a, a point of detail, we use macro data for the estimated total wealth, but do we use micro data to sort of distribute it across the, the, um, the population? So we really combine these, these two. Uh, now the macro data comes from SARB uh, and uh, with, uh, I mean, pros and cons, but, um, now, regarding this very question about the compliance, uh, we are not really in a position to say uh, 
uh, how uh, how well uh, the administration of the wealth tax would be uh, undertaken, uh, and of course it's. Uh, it, it depends on the context, it depends on the administration. And so, I mean, we hope like uh, SARS would be efficient at doing doing such a thing, but uh, of course there are like many elements that we, we many informations that we don't have as uh, policy researchers. Uh, just, but uh, we sort of take into account uh, the possibility for uh, part of the compliance not to be 100%. Uh, so people might evade the tax, people might over, over, um, um, Estimate their debt, for instance, because it's a tax on net wealth, and that's an issue that was uh, that's uh, that's quite important in terms of implement implementing a wealth tax in, in Col Colombia, for instance. So we sort of discuss these. Uh, I think I'm already too long, and that's only the first point. So uh, to address this in the estimation, we factor in. Uh, uh, some uh, approximation of by how much the tax base would be undermined by such behaviors, uh, uh, under reporting and evasion, that sort of things. So we take that into account and we have different estimates uh, depending on the assumptions we make about that. And I really uh, invite you to test all, whatever scenarios we ha you have in mind about these, uh, thanks to the simulator, which is online. You can Google like South Africa wealth tax you will be directed to the simulator. Um, now, question B, whether this includes non-liquid assets. Yes, it does, like housing. And so it is based on market value. Uh, Note that uh, it is more fair than property tax because property tax is uh, based on market value, but not taking debt into account, such that with the same value, people in debt and people not in debt pay the same property tax. It's not the case with the wealth tax we propose. And now see how this compares to other tax uh, proxying wealth. Oh, this is very large question. We have a section uh, fully dedicated to this into the into the paper. So I encourage you maybe to to go through this um, this part of the paper. It would be hard for me to really sum, sum that up. What we can say in general is that it would sort of perform a little bit better in, in aggregate uh, because we're targeting, targeting people really having wealth. Um, but it's yeah, it would it would require a more thorough discussion. So I think I cannot address this point here. And last but not least, I would just would like to mention that you do have indeed this equivalence between a perfectly uh, encompassing and well-designed uh, income tax and capital tax. So you can sort of impose um, uh, a tax 100% uh, rate sort of on a, on a capital return by adjusting the rates on the capital on the, on the capital income, but you also have to take into account that maybe you want to uh, have very, very rich people to have actually less wealth after the tax. So which, which, which what we call a confiscatory um, rate. So you might want to tax them uh, sort of more than what they earn from their wealth, at least from a short period of time. And this is a like sort of policy relevant to crisis, I think. So it should be taken into account uh, as, as a possibility. I, I feel that the debate here has been sort of uh, uh, assuming systematically that uh, rates that would imply more than 100% of capital return is not uh, a policy option, but I think it is, especially in times of crisis. Especially, sorry, especially in terms of crisis, but also especially in a in a in a country where you have about four thousand people that owns, according to our estimates, uh, more than the bottom fifty percent, so more than millions of people. I think this sort of rebalancing through maybe sometimes confiscatory rate does make sense. Thank you very much, Leo. I see our audience members have follow up questions, but we do. We have unfortunately come to the end of our session. We have gone 30 minutes beyond time. And thank you so much to the panelists for staying on to respond to all the questions from our from our um, audience members this morning. Thank you so much to yourself, Leo, Arup, Mimiki, as well as Chris, who's on the line this morning. A very big thank you to our audience. And I'd like to make a big thank you to our official partners without whom this would 
not have been possible. That's UNU wider, the National Treasury, the South African Revenue Service, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, the Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, the International Food Policy Research Institute, and most of all, the European Union for their continued commitment and invaluable financial support for this very important program. So to all our audience members, you can get all the research um, that was spoken about today and much more on the SA Tide website and do look out for our next SA Tide dialogue, which is scheduled for the 29th of June. And a big thank you to everyone who joined us this morning and do have a wonderful day further. Thank you very much.